I love the series that we are starting today uh, called Embrace Worship in keeping with our theme for 22 has been Embrace. And so we are addressing for the next three weeks, worship. Then we'll go into our Advent series called Worship Him. So we're going to be in this theme here for a little bit. Uh, I'm glad that you're here uh, to start this series off. We're going to be uh, covering today more of a call to worship. And the next couple Sundays may be some of the practical aspects of worship. So we're glad that you're a part of this. Whether I think about it or not, uh, it's become a reality to all of us that everyone that exists is designed to worship. The way we're created, aren't we? You can't keep from worshiping. You will worship something or someone. I mean, that is, look at mankind. Something is the center of our life, or someone is the center of life, because we've been created as worshipers. I want you to remember that as we go through today, because if we are to hear Jesus' words when he said, pray this way, that the Father's will, God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, I would suggest to you that that would represent as it's done in heaven. And in heaven, there's no resistance to the will of God. It's quick. It's responsive. It's immediate. Right? So if I were to say that our worship should be on earth as it is in heaven, would that be fair and right? I would say so. Because that's how we know. And if I were to go to the Bible to see how worship is happening or taking place, because when we start our worship on Sunday morning, occasionally you'll hear us say, we're not beginning anything, we're joining what's already going on in heaven. And that's the reality. And in chapter 4 of Revelation, And chapter 5, I see two things I want to emphasize today, and that is first, the place of worship, what it really means to come into the spiritual place of worship. I love the scripture that was just read on the wall, that the Father seeks those who worship Him, right? For those who worship Him must worship Him in what? The Spirit. There's something particular about what it means to be a true worshiper. And so as I go through chapter 4, I want you to hear the heart of what I believe is happening in heaven. When John has just seen some mighty things and been told some mighty things to tell to the seven churches, he comes into chapter 4 and he says, And after this, there before me was a door standing open in heaven. There was an entrance for him. And I can't help but think that that's what Christ has done for us, he's given us an entrance. When the veil was rent from top to bottom at his death, some say it was a 60-foot veil, some say a 90-foot veil. This is about 35 feet. So if you could imagine twice the height of this building, that when Jesus died, the veil was rent, which says that God no longer was in the temple, but also said we had full access. It was saying that's where we live. And when John hears this word, He said, there before me was a door, an entrance that was open into heaven. And he said, the voice that I first heard speaking to me that sound like a trumpet. When did he hear that? He heard that over in chapter 1. You might remember, he said, I heard a voice that spoke to me that sound like a trumpet. He said, I turned, and when I did, I saw one like the Son of Man standing among seven golden lampstands. And then he describes this Jesus that I want you to see when we talk about worship today. He said, he was clothed in a robe down to his feet, and across his chest was a golden sash. And it describes him as hair like wool, white as snow. We see Jesus as a judge and king. And it says in his right hand he had the seven stars. He was in control of those apostolic shepherds over those seven churches. He was protecting them and holding them and speaking to them. 
And it says, and his eyes were like flaming fire. And out of his mouth came a two-edged sword. And his feet were like they were standing in burning brass, in a furnace of brass. Now, I love Jesus walking along the shore of Galilee, gentle Jesus. But if you look into heaven, you see the king of kings. You see one who's worthy to be worshipped. And John said, when I heard his voice, I felt as though I was dead. That's why he says, the voice that I first heard that spoke to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I'll show you things that which must take place after this. And I love this part. He says, at once I was in the Spirit. Can I suggest to you, there are moments of worship that God wants us to experience. In a couple of weeks, we'll teach about our life being worship. Everything we do is worship, isn't it? Everywhere we go is worship. Let your work, he says, be done for the glory of God. Everything is worship. But I don't want to miss the fact that when we enter in, it's a place of worship, and those who really understand it, they really see him for who he is. And he said, there before me was this door that was open. He said, and I looked. And when he did, he said, there before me was a throne. And the throne room is the place that real worship begins. I, I've, I've got to tell you, when a revelation comes of worship, when he said, I was in the Spirit. Now, John knew as a born-again person, the Holy Spirit dwelt in him. But I want you to hear this. He didn't just reference the Holy Spirit dwelling in him. He said, I was in the Spirit. How is one who has the dwelling of the Holy Spirit also experiencing in the Spirit? I can tell you, there are times and moments and if you've never been hungry for worship before Him, that you literally experience what it means to be in the Spirit. John says, I was in the Spirit. Now, he'd already said that on the Lord's Day I was in the Spirit. But here he said, at once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne. I think it's interesting that worship starts before the throne. And he said, and the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Ruby, the invisible God. All he saw was a bright red crystal light, jasper light, red light. And he said there was a rainbow that shone like an emerald that encircled the throne. I want you to get this picture. I want you for just a moment to go to heaven with me. That in the spirit he saw this throne and someone sitting on the throne. He knew it was the Father God. He knew it was he who sits on the throne. All through the book of Revelation, you'll hear this term, he who sits on the throne. I want us to go from earth for just a moment into what I believe is true worship. He said, I saw, and the one who sat there had the appearance, and that rainbow shone around the throne. There was a bright green rainbow around the throne. And he said, and then surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones. And seated on those thrones were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold. What John saw is the church, the 12 tribes of Israel, and the 12 apostles of the Lamb, representing the fullness of God's people. Those in the Old Testament, according to Hebrews 11, looked towards the cross and were saved even as we are. As we look back to the cross, the full, complete covenant people of God sitting around the throne as elders representing us right now. When you worship, you join the church that's already around the throne. The white robe says they were clothed in righteousness. The golden crowns were crowns of righteousness that Paul says is prepared for me, but not me only, but all those who love his appearing. What do we see? We see God's people. Isn't it interesting? His creation, his church is around his throne to worship him. And he said they were dressed in this white robe in righteousness and the crown of gold. And then it says, and from the throne, watch this, came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. I want that kind of worship. I love to be able to wear jeans to church. I love the casualness of drinking coffee in the foyer. But I don't want to ever lose that holy reverence, worship before His throne where there's flashes of lightning, 
peals of thunder. Are you getting me? Rumblings. This is the presence of God. When we come before Him in worship, it is holy, awesome reverence. If we had five seconds that we could look into the throne, our worship would change. There would be no one gawking around. (laughs) There would be no one thinking about what they're going to do next week. For that moment, worship would be so engulfed in who is on the throne. And it says, in front of the throne, there were seven lamps blazing, which are the seven spirits of God. That may seem a little strange to us because it references the Holy Spirit, but the sevenfold multifacet, you'll see it in chapter 5 as well. The multifacet of the Holy Spirit is one, the Holy Spirit. You see the triune Godhead before the throne. You're going to see Him who sits on the throne. You're going to see the Lamb and the seven spirits of God or the Holy Spirit that's there before the throne. And he said, also in front of the throne, there was what appeared to be a sea of glass as clear as crystal, representing the labor before entering the tabernacle or the labor before the temple, which represents our baptism, that when we come to Christ, we're baptized into his body, but water baptism represents the faith and the circumcision of the heart that allows us to come before his throne room and enter into the holies of holies, which is completely open to us. We see a picture of the presence of God. What's amazing is this is the place of worship. This is the place we must come to, but there's more than that. I see, he says, and around the throne, he describes these creatures. You're talking about embracing one another that looks different here on this earth. You better get ready because God is a creative God. He's got things that you and I can't imagine around this throne. John described these living creatures that were covered in eyes in front and back. That's wild. (laughs) Meaning they could see everything. They're aware of the throne and aware of all things on the earth. They're aware of all the universe they were seeing. It says the first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had the face of a man. And the fourth was like a high-flying eagle. Why? Because I believe all of creation worships Him. Represented around the throne was the lion, which is the what? The tribe of the jungle. He's the chief of the jungle. And the ox, which is the greatest of domestic animals that bear the burden. And man, it wasn't a man, but this living creature had the face of a man because we are God's creation, created in His image. And the high-flying eagle is a majestic of the air, all of creation. Get this. Romans says that God reveals Himself and all of His nature and all of His power to all creation. So no man is without excuse. There are no atheists. There are only suppressors of truth, for God has come to reveal Himself. And not only in heaven, but on earth, but around around His throne. He has creation, night and day, worshiping Him. That's amazing. What are they saying? It says day and night. This gets to me, Galen. Day and night, they never stop saying, holy Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Listen at the foreverness. Who was, who is, and is to come. The prophet Isaiah saw it. He called them seraphims. He said, I saw them. They had six wings. He said, with two of the wings, they covered their face. No wonder they did because of the holiness of God. Two of their wings, they covered their feet. No wonder for the reverence of God. And two of their wings, they hovered around His throne. Are these the same? Probably are of what John sees. I wonder if you'd do something with me this morning just in the middle of my message. What if we stood and joined what's going on night and day? What if we were to say, holy, holy? What if every voice in this room? What if every person for just a moment would just leave the earth and join what's in heaven? Could we do that right now? 
Could every one of us just stand? And the first time, we're going to do it twice. The first time, I want you to repeat after me. And then afterwards, we're going to join simultaneously with what's in heaven. Is that okay? So if you want to lift your hands, you can. But say this after me. Say, holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty. Who was, who is, and who is to come. Now let's say it together with the angels in heaven. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Who was, who is, and who is to come. (laughs) Open our eyes to see a holy God. Do something in this house and worship, oh God. Impart to us what heaven worship is about on earth as it is in heaven, we pray. You're worthy. You're worthy. Just in the holy presence, you may be seated because it says when they did that, they would cry, holy, holy, holy. And it says whenever. I want you to see the sequence of worship. Worship flows from the throne. In a few weeks, we're going to talk about how worship flows. And we don't want worship flowing from the platform. It can be led by the platform, but it's got to flow from the throne among His people, doesn't it? It's got to come by the Spirit. It says that whenever these four living creatures gave honor and glory and power to Him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever. They add that part. This is forever and ever. What an awesome God. Whenever these four living creatures give glory and honor and power, it says these 24 elders fall down. (laughs) We're going to talk in a few weeks about some of the words of worship that says one of them is that we fall down before Him. You say, I thought that was a charismatic thing. No, that's a heavenly thing. (laughs) It's a heavenly thing. He said, they fall down before Him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever. And they take their crowns. Why do they take their crowns? Because they know that's not their crown. (laughs) When you worship, it's not about you. All of a sudden, it's about what Christ has done. That crown of righteousness is the completed work of Christ. If our worship does not declare what Christ has done, is it really worship? They would lay those crowns before the throne, and they would say, you are worthy. And I like the way they said you're worthy because they said, for you created all things. And by your will, they are created and have their being. I find that interesting because you're going to see worship here in just a moment of the centrality of worship or the object of worship. Here they're declaring the place of worship, that God is sovereign and God is is imminent. He's transcendent, but He's imminent. He's right now involved. He said, they said, because He created all things and by His will and they have their existence. When you woke up this morning with an extra hour of sleep, First time in a long time, I was tired of being in the bed. I went to bed at 9 o'clock. My wife went to bed at 8 o'clock. That was good, wasn't it? And about 5 this morning, I was tired of being in the bed. I need to get up. (laughs) But when you woke up this morning, how did you have breath? By His being. They hose all things together. See, when we start to realize that God is in every part of our life, worship shifts. There's no secular. There's no religious. It's light or dark. It's all about God and His creation, isn't it? And they worshiped about this. They knew that all of creation was created by God. And for His pleasure, they're created. And by His will, they're created. I think this is interesting because in chapter 4, I see the place of worship. If I were going to say to you, if you and I are going to really worship, it has to be before the throne. I'm not saying you have to see it every time, but you have to acknowledge that He's involved in every area of your life. You have to see the gloriness of worship, the holiness of worship, the reverence of who God is in worship. 
But that's not all. There's the object of worship. There's the center of worship. And that takes us into chapter 5. And the first thing he sees, and I saw him who was seated on the throne. He said, in his right hand, I saw in his right hand, he who sat on the throne, he had a scroll with writings on the front and back. That's interesting, isn't it? And it was, the scroll was sealed with seven seals. Who is this that's sitting on the throne? This is the Ancient of Days. This is the one he saw that had the appearance of Jasper and Ruby. This is Father God. He's sitting on the throne and he has in his hand, listen, he has in his hand eternal covenant. It's written on both sides because nothing can be added to it. Just like the law of God to Moses could not be added to it. This is the eternal covenant that the Ancient of Days has held in his hand. And he's holding it in his hand, which is the eternal covenant, which was purposed in Christ Jesus, according to Ephesians 3, when all things that God had planned was in his covenant. Here's the ancient of days from all time is holding in his hand this covenant called the scroll, sealed with seven seals. If you have a last will and testament, you have at least two people witness it. If you're wealthy in ancient days, you had three to five people. There are seven witnesses, seven seals. And if you read through the book of Revelation, you'd see as the gospel is unfolded, those who oppose the gospel in apostate Israel and in Rome would receive terrible judgments as they would oppose the Lamb of God. Even as it is today, the gospel is the rod of iron. You either submit to the gospel and be saved, or you reject the gospel and be damned. It's a pretty strong, stringent rule. Isn't it? And he held it. He said, I saw an angel proclaiming in a loud voice, that said, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break the seals and to look inside? And John said, there was no one worthy, both in heaven and earth and beneath the earth, to open the scrolls or even look inside. Abraham wasn't worthy. Moses wasn't worthy. David wasn't wasn't worthy. No one was worthy to open the seal of that eternal covenant. And John says, I wept and I wept for no one was worthy to open the scroll or to look inside. And one of the elders said to me, John said, do not weep. (laughs) Do not weep for the lion of the tribe of Judah has triumphed and he is able to open the seal, open the scroll and to break the seals. Notice what he said. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Who is that? That's Jesus coming in the fullness of time. The ancient of days holding this covenant in his right hand the right hand of power, and none was worthy. But then he said there is one who is what? The lion of the tribe of Judah, not just the seed of David, but the root of David, the beginning of David. And when you think he would turn and see a lion, what did he see? He said, I looked and I saw a lamb in the center of the throne. Watch the triune Godhead. He who's sitting on the throne in his right hand is the Father God. And then he said, and I saw a lamb in the center of the throne. And it had the appearance of a lamb that was slain. It blesses me because this tells me the object of our worship. Heaven is not ashamed of the lamb that was slain. Heaven is not afraid. In fact, worship is around the cross. The death of Jesus. We have not yet understood the importance of the gospel. We grasp at the gospel. We ask for revelation of the gospel. But if all of heaven has in the center of the throne the gospel display, come on church, there's something about the gospel we should hunger for. For it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Why? because it reveals the righteousness of God. To those who believe, it reveals the righteousness. How does the gospel reveal the righteousness? That's the lamb that had the appearance of being slain. 
That's our Christ. He said he had seven horns. That's a weird picture, isn't it? I love God, don't you? This may be a prophetic picture. It may be actually the way it is. I don't know, but I get it. He had seven horns, meaning his authority. Seven is complete. It's full. It's holy, right? Had seven thorns on his head, the crowns that would be of his authority. And he said, and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, meaning the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. How many of you glad the Holy Spirit is sent out in all the earth? He's describing what he's seeing, and it's amazing, of the lamb that was slain. The lamb, he said, that was there. He's describing this. And it says, and he, I love this, and he, he, he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now I want you to watch this, because this tells us about worship. Who is worthy? The scripture says he went. Everybody say he went. And he took the scroll from the right hand. When he did that, all of heaven broke loose. No wonder when one sinner repents, all of heaven rejoices. <laughs> because it's a reflection on the completed work of Christ. It's another one that came into the kingdom of his eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ. And it says, and when he took that, he went to the one who was on the throne and took that which was from his right hand, the scripture says, and when he had taken it, what happened? When he took the scroll, it says, and when he had taken it, the, living, the four living uh, creatures, it says, and the 24 elders did what? They fell down again. They fell down before the lamb. And each one, talking about these elders, had a lamp and golden bowls full of incense which are the prayers of the saints. First they had a harp. Somebody said there's music in heaven. <laughs> you can tell some folks that just in case they don't know. There's music in heaven. And I, I guess they've been singing songs with the harp because in the next little bit he says they sang a new song. But they had harps and they had golden bowls. What? Which is kept before the throne. Listen to me. If you ever think your worship and your prayer is a waste of time, look again at the book of Revelation. For the prayers of the saints are kept in golden bowls before the throne. And in chapter 8 it says that he takes the prayers of the saints which are the incense off, the, and he mixes it with the coals off the altar, and he casts it to the earth to perform his purposes. The church's prayers that are prayed according to his will are kept before the throne, the church around the throne, holding the prayers of the saints, not one prayer of any century, Jonathan, not one prayer of your parents, not one prayer of your grandparents, not one prayer of this church. When we gather to pray, no, it's holy time. Worship is is one of the highest forms of prayer. I'll never forget as a young pastor, I'm literally dancing around in my office, singing in the Spirit, for those of you who want to know. I'm worshiping, and I thought of this family and this family and this family and this family and this family that needed prayer. And I actually stopped and I apologized to God. I said, God, I got to get back to praying. <laughs> It's like I heard the Holy Spirit say, you are in the highest form of prayer. Worship when we proclaim Him. I believe our prayers and our worship are preserved before His throne. He said they had these golden bowls full of the incense, which are the prayers of the song. And He said when they fell down, they, they sang a new song. Listen to the new song. You are worthy. Now watch. First, the elders said in chapter 4, you're worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you created all things and by your will you create them and they exist. Now we get to the center of worship. Now we get into the object of worship, which is what? The lamb that was slain. All of heaven is proclaiming. Listen to what they says. And they sang a new song that says, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And your blood purchased for God 
persons from every tribe and every language and every people and every nation. I want you to see the church is multi-ethnic. Even in heaven, he identifies people of every tribe, of every nation, and every language. You might as well get used to each other right now in the church because the church is eternal. And the church in heaven and the church on earth are not separate. <laughs> you mind me saying something about your mom? Jonathan and his family are walking the process of the last days of his precious mom, Carol. We stood beside her bed last night and thought of these verses. I'm telling you, church, when you start seeing eternity, as much as Jonathan's going to miss his mom, as much as you love someone, I'm telling you guys, we're created for eternity. And the more this world has a hold of us, the less of worship we enter into. No wonder I think John was caught up. <laughs> There's some in this room that God's calling you to a new level of worship in your life. It doesn't mean you won't be responsible for things in this world. You'll work hard, labor hard, do that which is responsible because you're called to do that too. But inside, you're going to see beyond that. It's going to be the paradox that Jonathan's walking through, loving his mom but seeing eternity. That's how we walk. We live our life one foot in this world and another foot in the world to come. I've heard people say, so-and-so is so heavily minded, they're no earthly good. And I'm going to tell you, that's impossible. I'm saying you're no earthly good if you're not heavenly minded. Because you're doing it after your own strength, aren't you? And they sang that new song. And he goes on to say, you have made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they will reign on earth. Hello, church. And then I like this verse. Then I looked and heard a voice of many angels. <laughs> so you've got the four living creatures. You've got the church represented by the elders. You've got all the creation represented, and now all of heaven host. I love this. And the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000. What does that mean? A bunch. <laughs> 10 is the highest number you can count. Did you know that? Once you get beyond 10, it's just 10 plus 1. 10 is a number of completion. So when he would say 10,000 times 10,000, what's he saying? I saw thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000. I mean, that's all of them. And they're gathered around the throne. Not only do you have the four living creatures worshiping and the elders worshiping, not only that, but now you have the angels. Listen, and they've gathered around the throne and they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And listen, in a loud voice. Everybody say a loud voice. <laughs> God's not nervous when we worship. You can be loud, can't you? You can be quiet. I get that. There is one passage that there was silence in heaven for half an hour. But worship oftentimes is thunderous. Thunderous. I love being around people that are not afraid to worship because it reminds me of heaven. And it says, they encircled the throne, the living creatures, in a loud voice. This is what they were saying. I love this. Worthy is the Lamb. This is the object of our worship. Who was slain? Would you say that with me? Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Say it again. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Would you like to stand with me and let's say these last few verses together? Say that with me one more time. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Listen to what he says. Worthy for what? To receive power and wealth 
and wisdom and strength, honor and glory and praise. I want to say it again. It's interesting what he says. Worthy is the Lamb. Why is he worthy? Who was slain? May our worship be the center of the completed work of Christ. I've watched in this house, Joel, when we begin to sing songs about the gospel, when we sing songs about what Christ did, we sing songs about the forgiveness of sin and the blood washing away our sins. Every mouth in this place opens up. Every heart begins to worship. Why? There's some connection about the center of our worship. The object of our worship is the Christ who is worthy because he was slain. And anything we ascribe to him, he says, to receive power, you're worthy. Doesn't he have power? Yes, but he's worthy. He says, and wealth. Well, my land, doesn't he have wealth? Yes, but he's worthy. And he says, wisdom and strength and honor and power, he said, and glory and praise. Is there any praise in this place? Is there any honor in this place? Is there any worship in this place? Listen to what it says. And when then he said, and I heard every creature. Come on now. Every creature. Let this be so. Every creature, both in heaven and in earth and beneath the earth and in the sea and all they that dwell therein. He didn't leave anybody out. I like what he said, in the sea, in case somebody's floating out there on a boat, and all that dwell therein, all of the fish of the sea, all of the creation, let everything, and he says, when they sung that song and they declared that to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, watch both things. He who sits on the throne, who is that? That's Father God, and to the Lamb. You see the triune Godhead all through the book of Revelation. He who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Who are we worshiping? He who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And the Holy Spirit moves among us that we might give glory and praise. For he that worships Him must worship Him in spirit. You must worship Him in the spirit. For the Holy Spirit dwells within His people. And it says, and when they said that, when they declared that, the four living creatures, hear them, they said, Amen. So be it. Amen. So be it. The angels did their part. Here's what I want you to see. When worship starts in heaven, there's no individualistic worship. When the four living creatures cry in response, the 24 elders respond. When the angels cry, the four living creatures say amen. And then it says, and the elders fell down in worship. Could we turn this right now into a place of heaven of worship? Could we do that for the next few minutes? I want you to close your eyes. The worship team is going to sing. I invite you to kneel at the altar. I invite you to kneel at your seat. I invite you to stand in His presence. I invite you to sit in His presence. But I want us Forget everybody else around us right now and be caught up in the Spirit to worship. Sing this team, and may we worship like never before. Come on, let's do it.